Good evening. Welcome to the 5-8, where we take each of the week's five most fucked up topics and discuss them for eight minutes each. Five topics, eight minutes, two hosts, a guest, and singing, a lot of curse words, and as many cocktails as we deem necessary. LB, how are yes, you? I'm good. Good. I'm having I, one cocktail. I deem one cocktail necessary this week. <laughs> What cocktail prey are we having? I'm having my uh, I'm having my tonic with roses lime and this time with a little bit of vodka in it. All right. That's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you're doing uh, your I'm Manhattan. doing my Manhattan with a little twist. Uh, mm -hmm. last week's guest, Jen Murchia, sent me the cherries you can see above my head here. Where are they? Oh, look at them. And yeah. how are they? Um, they are spectacular. Oh my! Um, oh and wow! They in this this vase that looks like like John Keats could write a poem about it. It's like ah. a Greek of a vase. It's wonderful, and uh, it, it really classes up the joint. The Luxardo ones are great too, but that, that just the the vessel in which these cherries are, it's really something. And you know, this is a week LB when I think it's okay to break out the nice things because I, um, I do too. Lots I think of things happen this week. A week. lot happened, and I I I. Yes, there was a lot that happened this week. And I want to say that I thoroughly enjoyed much of it, <laughs> most all of it. Yeah. I don't care what that makes me sound like. I really enjoyed all of the pretty pictures that we got to and the gazing upon the, the beautiful people who went and got their pictures taken in Georgia. Yeah. Yeah. I it liked nice. it. I liked it too. Yeah. I thought it was good. Um, and I enjoyed, I don't know if everybody could catch that. I was thinking as I was watching Chunk's uh, new open, we've so got good. some new things going there. Like, so you know, if, if folks haven't seen this before, they don't know there's a progression to all these things. <laughs> you know? So watching um, Prigogine get shot down was, uh, oh my God, spectacular. Yeah. He went, he went from a yeah. cartoon and, and in real life, I got to yeah. say. He Again. went from coup attempt to uh, you know being on our on our show being spoofed in my come to Belarus ad to um, to this in two to months. This. Yeah, two yeah, months. we got a pretty good track record going here. Um, you know, we we seem to the traitors are easy to spot, as someone oh, yeah. I know has a habit of saying. Yeah. Uh oh, you're looking at something. Everything okay? Uh, we're telling me my microphone is down, and even though I did it, it's. Uh, now it should be better. So. That sounds so much better. You did sound like you were kind of in a hole there. I was in a hole, and now I'm not. Yeah. I was now some, you're not. Okay, it was, perfect. You know, it was like some spy microphone. You know, lovely. Yeah. It should be good now. Do you? I and I now have to ask because, um, you know, this is a this is a banner event. It's like the lunar landing. You know, where were you when you saw the mugshot? Oh well, I had almost given up. Um, because it just was taking forever and that I don't want to listen. I know that you went ahead and listened to news, which you don't normally do. I, never I find that. everyone just, uh, the talking heads trying to eat up airtime as they're anticipating something. I find that to be the most annoying of all chatter. And so I just was like, ugh, when is it going to happen? So I'm checking X or Twitter or shitter, as I call it. I'm checking shitter. I'm checking sheeter. I'm checking it, checking it. And I see the fake one. I think for a second that might be real. I guess I kind of predicted there'd be a lot of fake ones, right? Not necessarily that looked that good. And so then I started to string together and thread together the fake ones that were coming out, including the ones that people were spoofing, the memes. And then I saw one and I knew it was the real one. I just, I just knew it in my bones, but it wasn't confirmed yet. So I tweeted that out and then I kind of retired. And because I, I was waiting and waiting and I just mm -hmm. like, I'm giving up. So that's where I was. I was tweeting it out, tweeting it out. Apparently I was right. And I got the early, the good one early. You did. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's what I was doing. But I'll, you know, we were all, we had a, we put a nice spread out. My family and I, we had, we had our cocktails last night too, as well, which we don't normally do <laughs> two in uh -huh. a row. And um, we enjoyed it. We, we, it was quite, I, I thought it was quite entertaining and lovely except for the talking heads. 
I liked the talking heads. And I, I, again, I literally have not turned on the TV to watch cable since the basketball season ended like months ago. Yeah. So I was like, ah, eh, I'll just, I'll just turn this on. And, uh, I thought everybody was really on point and had good things to say. Um, you know, Ari, but they were all really good. I thought, um, again, I never watched the shows, but, yeah. um, there was a, so we're watching all the things, listening to the points and, and stuff like that. And, um, and then there comes a moment where Rachel comes out and she's like, okay, uh, if you're doing the dishes, you might want to stop now. And um, so I gathered my family, my two children and my wife, and we gathered in front of the TV and they, un I had already seen the damn thing on Twitter, but they unveiled it on the TV and my, my family guffawed. They laughed so hard. They were laughing at this man. And I don't know yeah. what, what he thought he was accomplishing <laughs> with this, but you know, the, the result was you're being really ridiculed by children, dude. So, um, you know, yeah. my one son said that, you know, his, his anger line is darker than his tie, which I thought was a good, that's line. A good line. That's a good line. Yeah. yeah. It's got some good lines already. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, and it was clear that he had rehearsed where he was going to put his face, how he's going to scowl because they had all those memes ready. So he knew he wanted the extra space around him. Um, I don't want to get into it too much, you guys, because I just we have th stuff. Yeah, we got we got a lot of fun things. We got a lot of fun things we to got talk a great about. Guest. But yes, absolutely, it was absurd that the Georgia sheriffs let him uh, just announce his weight, announce his hair color, you know, whatever he wants, he writes it in, or his aides write it in, and it's just absurd. It, it, I, you know, to use it to further his propaganda. We all expected that, but I just don't think in the end, not, I just don't think any of this is going to work. And I think he's going to flee. So I'm back to that. I believe this man will flee the country. We'll talk about that in a bit. Okay. That's, that's coming up later. Okay? okay. Just to, just to put some, what does Allison say? Some beans on that. Okay. Okay. Uh, what, one more thing quickly about the, the, the mug shots. I mean, they're all like these terrible photos. And then Jenna Ellis looks like she's going to use it for her Tinder profile. Yeah, like, what's she the is. Like, it's, it's like really crazy. Oh, God bless her. Yeah, I hope somebody, she's, she's like, hi, I need somebody to pay my legal bills, please. I need a lawyer to do pro bono work. and take She needs a lawyer. Yeah, she yeah. really does. Yeah. Making attorneys get attorneys. Okay. Shall All right. Begin? Let's dive in. Eight minute, the clock is going. What's our first topic, Mr. Oh, the, Oliar? The topic is pay off Lenny. And right. as watchers of this show know, Payoff Lenny is my little nickname for Leonard Leo. Um, everybody who's watched this show and who's read my work on Prevail know that this guy is my personal bugbear. Um, I don't think we need to go into who he is, but he is basically co-founder of the Federalist Society and this dark money spider that just has his, uh, you know, webs all over D.C. and elsewhere. And soaks up so much dark money and sloshes it around behind the scenes and is responsible for installing basically six of this, you know, he's friends with Clarence Thomas. He was lightly into, into a Lido. And then the other four, he was, you know, involved with um, installing in there. So he really is the human being most responsible for overturning Roe v. Wade. Yeah. That's who he is. He's a, um, he's a weirdo. He's a radical Catholic weirdo whose belief system does not uh, cohere with any Catholicism that I grew up with or the Catholicism of anybody that I know. Um, and he wants us all to feel the way that he does. And he's he's going to create fascism here to have that happen. That's who he is. OK. And I've been trying to make this guy famous. I don't know why he isn't. His name is Leonard Leo for fuck's sake. Um, this is a you know, it's a comic book bad guy name, as we've discussed before. Anyway. Among all this wonderful news this week, among all the mugshots coming out, this report from Heidi Prisbola at Politico, D.C. Attorney General is probing Leonard Leo's network. Greg Oliar. Yeah, right? Wow. Yeah. How about that? So now, I what does that mean? To re refresh everybody of what that means. What is his network? Well, his network is he has a lot of not-for-profits and non-profits and 50CB blah, blah, blurs that he sets up these things. And it's almost like, I guess, that you know, the thing was Three Card Monty last week. But it's this idea where if you're in a, this kind of not-profit, I think the rule is that you can't donate more than 49% to political causes. Right. So what he'll do, he'll, he'll 49% of he'll, he'll set up something and he'll call it, um, 
Ivan the Terrible LLC, whatever. And then he'll he give sell 40, companies. He 40, does. Yes. Literally does. Forty nine percent. And then he'll donate money to uh, the next company, which is uh, Michael Romanoff, whatever. I'm doing Russian czars sort of in order. OK. And then forty nine percent of that gets don't. And then the rest of it gets donated to uh, I forget who was after Michael. I think it was, uh, you know, let's just jump to Peter the Great, you know, and uh, and so on. And it's the it's this asymptotic line where he's never going to use up all the money, but he's going to give a lot of it away to political causes, which he's not allowed to do. So this is the this is the game. It's all legal. It's not you know, he's not breaking any laws. It's just it it's flies in the face of the spirit of the law. So now he got this big donation from Barry side, this, you know, moribund electronics magnate uh, that our friend Nina Burley wrote about. Uh, great piece in New Republic that if anybody hasn't seen that, please go read it. Um, so that's who he is. He's sitting on $1.6 billion, this yeah. guy, which is, you know, devastating for democracy because as Nina pointed out, he can basically spend millions and millions and millions of dollars forever and never even touch the principal, you know, right. of that money. And it's, it's horrifying. So anyway, I'm just going to read a couple passages. This is Heidi Prisbilla's piece from Politico. <clears throat> Love this. The scope of the investigation is unclear, but it comes after Politico reported in March that one of Leo's nonprofits, registered as a charity, paid his for-profit company tens of millions of dollars in the two years since he joined the company. Hmm. A few weeks later, a progressive watchdog group filed a complaint with the D.C. Attorney General and the IRS requesting a probe into what services were provided and whether Leo was in violation of laws against using charities for personal enrichment. Hmm. How many mansions in Maine does he own that he bought recently? More hmm. than one. Okay. Um, moving on. The news of the investigation comes as the nonprofit non -profit that was subject of the complaint quietly relocated in recent weeks from the capital area to Texas, according to paperwork filed in Virginia and Texas. For nearly 20 years, the nonprofit, now known as the 85 Fund, which is like 5-8, but backwards, right? So we can remember yeah. this. It's like... They're the anti-us, uh, had been incorporated in Virginia. Uh, okay, I'll skip this. Okay, uh, the Leo assigned nonprofit, the 85 Fund, which is registered as a tax exempt charity, paid tens of millions of dollars to a public relations firm in Virginia, which he co chairs in the two years since he joined the firm, known as CRC Advisors. The watchdog complaint alleges the total amount of money that flowed from Leo aligned nonprofits to his for profit firms was, want to guess? Mm. You're going to be under. It's 73 million over six years beginning in 2016. Oh, what happened in 2016? Oh, right. He started pushing judges onto the Supreme Court. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. <clears throat> There are questions as to whether Leo affiliated nonprofits have diverted substantial portions of their income and assets directly or indirectly to the personal benefit of Leonard Leo read the campaign for accountability's complaint. Uh, okay. Let's see here. Um, this, this 85 thing is now run by Carrie Saravino, an attorney and former clerk for justice, Clarence Thomas. Whoa. Uh, listed as director in the group's most recent IRS paperwork and is collecting massive amounts of anonymous funds, $117 million. In, in anonymous funds? That's what the article says. Yeah. So not, oh my God. All right, well. well no, no, there, it gets better. There's oh more. Boy. There's more. Okay. Further okay. complicating the picture. In Texas, a new registration for the 85 fund was filed on June 27th under yet a different address in a different city than the one listed on the Virginia paperwork. It is also registered in Texas as a for-profit entity. This is my favorite line here. Okay. <clears throat> this location is a UPS store in a strip mall yeah. next door to a restaurant called the Snooty Pig Cafe. <laughs> oh, she must have been so happy writing that. Um, it used to use the UPS drop blocks, blah, 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 blah. Um, anyway, you get the idea. Please go read this article. It's good. But the point is, you know, it feels like, um, you know, Leonard Leo was tasked to do something and he did something. And now he's, um, I don't know, cashing in. I'm not saying he did that. Lord knows I don't know. But it certainly appears that way. Some of this big, you know, Catholic guy. I'm giving the charity and the, eh, I don't know. How many millions did you, did you go from? And again, these companies are not big that he sits yeah. on. Like when his CRC advisors is like, you know, it's like, I think a dozen people or something. 
Like it's, these are small places. So, you know, and it's always the same, like handful of names that are yeah. on the boards and the board. Are they all lawyers? Maybe some are assistants. I don't know. A lot of them are lawyers though. Yeah. A lot of them are lawyers. He likes his lawyers. He's a big lawyer guy. It's yeah. the lawyers, everybody. Mm. All right. 23 seconds left. I have nothing to add to that other than I haven't read that article, so I'm going to go read it. I, we've been talking <laughs> about it, but I never got to reading it. Um, you know, and there's just, there's no, oh, these weird, is he Opus Day? I know we, we're, we're like, not, we don't look, I don't know who is Opus Day. I, unless he, I'm going to bring it around when I get to Prigazhin. So I'm asking. Look, he's associated with the Catholic Information Center, which is Opus Day, and he sits on the board. So there we go. I can't say for sure that he is, but you know, he's, he's certainly he's Opus Dei adjacent, let's say. All right, we're going right into the next one, if that's okay, because I do want to get yeah, to no, this. no, we don't want to. Um, so okay. <laughs> you you surprised me with this title. Greg did the title. <laughs> Wake me up before Prigo goes. Um, you know, listen, Prigogine, for those of you who uh, I, I think our whole entire audience knows who uh Prigogine is, but this was he was known as Putin's chef because he He's a gangster. He's just a gangster. And I love that General McCaffrey, I, I think it was, came out on right when he was, he perished this week, fell from the sky. Um, I love that uh, McCaffrey called him. He just straight up called him a gangster. He's like, look, this guy's a gangster. He, we know, he came out of organized <laughs> crime. I'm like, oh, my God. Yes. Mm -hmm. So Prigogine was one of the first Russian gangsters uh, that I was digging uh uh, or early ones that I was digging up all the LLCs on. And there's an article that came out quite a while back. Um, I can't remember. It's, I had to translate the whole thing. I, I apologize. I, it might have been in Italian. Um, but they were, it was back in 2018, he was associated with, and they figured out that he was uh, the head of this company called M Invest. Amazon Michael Invest. Okay. So, that LLC, I was like, oh, okay, how interesting. I'm going to go look this up. So I went digging through the offshore uh, leaks database and found um, M Invest and found that it was, oh, look, connected to um, some other articles in terms of another person inside of M, M Invest from Italy that was involved in all those weird, gruesome banker murders connected through the Opus Dei. <laughs> So just so you know, this is uh, uh, this guy has been a long time um, dead now, uh, but long time in with the gangster crew that was also all hooked up into Italy, which of all of the Russian bratvas, it's either going to be the Tambov Mafia or the Sultanskaya Mafia, yeah, one out of St. Petersburg, one out of Moscow. Those are the two. And, you know, all the work on Mogilevich, everybody knows he was sort of inside of all of that in the in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. Um, so that's a lot of, those are for the Russian uh, gangster followers, just to let you know, go back through all of that, look up the article on M Invest and um, or anything you can find on that. And then if you go into uh, looking into my timeline, all of those LLCs are still, I still have them posted up. They're still on my Twitter account. Okay, why is this important? Well, Prigogine was really, crucial to, uh, although we have him associated with Wagner Group, which is, you know, the thing he became globally known for, this mercenary group, private mercenary group, um, PMC out of, uh, out of Russia, connected to Putin directly, that was operating a lot in, they were operating in Ukraine, they were operating in Chechnya and around all those areas, but very much focused on Africa. Yeah. Um, and Sudan was a big area for uh, Prigogine. For, um, so that article also is connected into the kinds of money and pillaging that were happening out of Suzanne, Sudan with those um, Wagner Group operations. So all of those sort of mercenary destabling oper operations, there's always some huge cache of money, either natural resources or maybe they're trafficking arms or trafficking human beings and they need a pathway to do it. There was a corrupt... Um, I was sure it was a very corrupt uh, leader there that then got killed and the people were going to overthrow and blah, 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 blah. So this guy really was an instrument of the Kremlin and of Putin 
but on the side of all of the gangsters. I think it's perfect that he had a catering company. It's very Sopranos of him. It's very, <laughs> it's very New Jersey, um, you know, that, that he was involved in the food and all of that. And that's sort of how he got, Putin was pushing money into that through, again, through Panama Papers, exposed all this through the offshores, pushing money into this catering company. Well, that's money that was being laundered, pilfered, you know, from natural resources or what it looks like most of the focus of it for Prigozhin to spend was in Sudan. All right. So then what we all know what happened to him. If you're watching the news, he, you know, that wasn't that long ago. What was it? Three weeks ago, four weeks ago, he staged a coup. Uh, it was two months to, ago to the day. Two months ago to the day. Sorry. He tried to come in because there's Shoigu, who I can never say his name right either, but uh, that was that's sort of the general at the beginning of the and he's one of Putin's generals, but the guy at the beginning of along with Gerasimov of uh, the Ukraine plan, right ahead of the you know this two day or three day military operation or whatever they call it called whatever Putin was calling it that's now stretched into this horrible genocidal war that they've been waging on the poor Ukrainian people. Um, the there was a disruption between Prigozhin and Shoigu. And where it looked like Prigozhin's Wagner group was getting starved out of not having the resources that they need. This was coming from Prigozhin. So he decided he was going to go in and two months ago and kind of get rid of the military leadership. He failed, but it was a bit, big embarrassment to Putin. And I think we were on the show and I said at the time, I said, I'm giving it to the end of the weekend. One of those two guys is dead, either, either Putin or Prigozhin, because it's really at the core of this 20 to 30 year, it's 20 years for Putin, about 25 years for Putin, and a couple of years behind him, before him, this mafia war that has been happening and this territorial war that has been happening from inside of Russia, right, that has stretched out into all the reaches of both the former Soviet Republic um, in terms of stealing resources, but also into extending into Africa, extending into other nations as well, or continents as well, but specifically there. And a lot of activity early on in Italy, which is why we have that murder and that M invest and all of that. So there is my mafia history on this guy. This is a major, major crime lord and gangster, just a mafioso that Putin shot down. I don't know why he waited two months to do it. I suspect there's, and of course the Kremlin's denying it. I don't know, whatever. They deny everything. But uh, something's afoot. Something's afoot that he didn't get killed right away. Something's afoot that he was then killed two months later. Something's afoot in that this guy was really careful about his movement. Really mm -hmm. careful. A lot of people were after him because of what he has been up to. So he didn't just like, here's my name on a manifest of my own private plane and here you go. So I don't know whether they, he knew this was happening and it was like, this is how he knew, he, they were like, we're going to kill you, dude. And he's like, well, this is how I want to go. Or I don't know. I, I, there is, it's, this, it's strange. It's strange, but altogether expected. That's my Ferguson. And I couldn't be happier that Chunk animated him <laughs> being shot down out of the sky. I laughed so hard. I laughed so hard. Perfect eight minutes. Nice, nice landing. Unlike Pergosian, nice landing. Thank you. Yeah, way to land the plane. I landed the plane. <laughs> um, I think we should celebrate a little bit. What do you I th think? I think we should. Couple quick things about Pergosian before we move on. Yes. Um, First of all, just to remind everybody, he was in charge of the IRA that fucked with the 2016 election and helped install Trump. That's, uh, you know, apart from all the other fuckery and the war crimes that he's involved with, he did that. And yeah. the second thing, the se um, he's not part of the Wagner, you know, that group is sort of outside of Russia, but part of Russia. Mm -hmm. And th there's a book by uh, Tom Kent, um, who I used to work with at AP, who I, I'm constantly confused that I'm going to, I, I'm terrified i'm going to confuse his name with the name of our guest just to give a little hint um he wrote a book about combating russian disinformation and he, in that book he was talking about how you know it's good it's useful for people like putin to have these like extra 
you know, uh, extracurricular organizations because they create plausible deniability. Yeah. Putin can say, oh, it's not me. It's not Russia. It's uh, I don't know this guy when right. in fact they are working together and, and, right. and all this kind of stuff. So uh, there's that. And, and finally, he has the same, he has the same mm -hmm. name as Michael Cohen, one of Michael Cohen's LLCs, just FYI. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing is, look, I, no, no one really likes to celebrate when a plane goes down because it's no. like morbid and gruesome and weird. But the, all the people like, I feel bad for the for the crew on board, the innocent crew. And it's like, guys, this isn't the United flight to Pittsburgh. It's not like a flight attendant that's going to stay in the hotel. Everybody on that plane was a bad guy. It, sorry. You know, Pretty much. save your there, there's a lot of bad stuff happening to a lot of like people that don't deserve it. So save your sympathy for that. These people are, you know, goodbye. Uh, lose no sleep over them, please. That's that's my that's my. No, time. they uh, they create child soldiers and then slaughter them. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Not a good not a good group of people. No. All right. Now. Uh huh. Let's lighten it up a little, shall we? I think it's time to lighten it up. So, look, all I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more that we have. This magic moment, so different and so new, but like any other, till they arrested you. It finally happened. It took us by surprise. I knew that you felt it too. By the look of fear in your eyes. Sweeter than wine. Softer than the Georgia night. Everything I want I have. Don't let the prison bed bugs bite. This magic moment So different and so new Like any other Till they booked and processed you Mr. Secretary, was the President here asking you for exactly what he wanted? One more vote than his opponent uh -huh. What I knew is that we didn't have any votes to find. We had continued to look. Uh, we investigated, like I just shared the numbers with you. There were no votes to find. That was an accurate count that had been certified. <laughs> nice, nice work on that, LB. Thank nice you. work on that. Nice work on, on that. That that was <laughs> that was all you. It was all you. Genius. Love it. Well, thank you for singing it. <laughs> yeah, badly. Yes. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Oh um, my! Yeah, I, the, you know it's something to see them all together. It is a it is a magical moment. Yeah, it uh, is. No, it's a perfect song. Really, the perfect yeah. song to use. Perfect song to use. Okay, it's yes. time to bring out our guest. He is a uh, Silicon Valley based CEO and entrepreneur. In fact, he owns a prop from that show, which you're going to be able to see behind him. Um, he's an activist with tech policy, which he's going to talk about, and he's the author of a best selling book bestseller called Containing Big Tech, How to Protect Our Civil Rights, Economy, and Democracy, Tom Kemp. Welcome to the 5A. Hey, great to be here. What a crazy week. You got uh, <laughs> the guy throwing out, a, getting thrown out of a 30,000 foot window, and then you've got the <laughs> uh, mug shots happening. The window so, answer, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. this is great. Great week to join. It's a new, yeah, no, you, you picked a week. So, okay. Before we get into all the, all this, the tech stuff, um, you know, we have to ask, where were you when you saw the mugshot? You know, and what I was, was your lying week? in bed, just like, <laughs> I was just like flipping through Twitter and I saw the fake ones. I was like, no, that can't be right. And then, you know, it's just kind of hitting the refresh on your phone and then boom, <laughs> there it was. And then there was that scowl, as you said, I think he completely scripted exactly like the head, the hair, the flock of seagulls hair. Uh, and, uh, you know, and he knew that he was going to put this on mugs and t-shirts, you know, yeah, it, it's all, uh, it's all part of the grift. Hmm. Well, I wonder if you because so are we, so it's nice <laughs> to have a wonderful photo. Thank you, Donald. Yeah. 
I wonder if the flock of seagulls is a hint at what country he's going to flee to. Because I ran, I ran, right? That's Isn't right. Yeah. That's right. So yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah. yeah. That's it. We don't have a ga- We don't have a groaning uh, <laughs> sound here, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, okay. So your book is it came out on Tuesday, or I guess the book still yeah. drop on Tuesday. Okay, it came out this week. It immediately rose to the top of, of, of the charts on Amazon. Um, I, I read it uh, when, when you were on uh, my show uh, a few months ago. It's terrific. I encourage people to check it out. But um, for people unfamiliar, talk a little bit about the book, what it's about, and and why you decided to write it. Well, here I'm I'm based in Silicon Valley, and uh, I've been living and breathing tech startups, investing in companies, venture capitalist, and competing against the the big tech companies, uh, but also have companies that partner with them. And, you know, the reality is that they've become huge monopolies. Um, And we've had monopolies in the past, like Standard Oil, but Standard Oil didn't know everything about us, which is super Mm. scary. Um, And their reach is incredible. I mean, it took like 100 years for GM to get to 500 million cars sold. You know, it took like a decade to get to a couple billion users for some of these tech companies as well. So what I wanted to do is simply like lay out, hey, here are the issues as it relates to their business model of surveilling us and collecting as much information. Really spent a lot of time on AI. Um, And so I think it was kind of fortuitous, all my research and everything I've been doing, then obviously we, we have this huge AI revolution. But then also wanted to talk about, you know, how their monopoly position exasperates the problems that we have with digital surveillance and how AI can be used in a biased and exploitive manner. So I just wanted to tie everything together and and give kind of a guy on the ground here in Silicon Valley's perspective as opposed to an academic or something like that. So and and just to recap, like you did a really good job with that because you don't have to know anything about tech to read this book and to get stuff out of it. Like I think you do a good job of I don't want to say dumbing it down, but, but speaking in a way that, you know, people can understand without having uh, some, because sometimes when people are experts in fields, you try to read something that they write and you're less like, what is going on with this? Yeah. I want, I wanted to get, make the book so that I could, you could hand it to your uncle Larry or some, you know, someone that's an informed citizen and just say, Hey, I care about this issue. Um, you know, tell me more about it, explain it to me. So I didn't want to get into the weeds with this. So. Well, what are some of the biases? What are, like can we can we just go to AI for a second? What are some of the ways in which you see it uh, can be even more manipulative since they these companies do have all of our data, all of our every breath and fart is what I say. You know that digital exhaust, right? They collect, yeah. digital, they Hoover up our digital exhaust. Yes. Their, their model is collect as much information and serve ads. And what they want to do is they want to target for the advertisers, you know, people at a very granular level. The, the issue is that if you want to say, hey, I want to target, you know, young women with babies and and uh, serve them ads about diapers. The issue is, is that the same people, there's people that could like flip that on its head and say, I want to, ex- I, I, I want to exclude showing rental ads or job ads to Mm. young women with children. In fact, both Google and Facebook at the time, now Meta, were found guilty by the government of having their AI systems programmed so that people could kind of, you know, flip it. So if you can do as much targeting as possible on individuals to sell them something, you can actually discriminate against those people in terms of jobs, rentals, the list goes on as well. And so that's the issue that we have with this the AI systems that they can introduce bias into them and they can actually discriminate against people. And what we really need is the ability to, hey, I have the ability to object um, to the decision right. being made by automated decision making. I mean, I don't think AI is going to repl- like, look, you know, if you're going to discriminate, you need actual Fred Trump to be able to, you know, to handle it. You can't, <laughs> AI can't replace Fred Trump when it comes oh, to Oh, actually it can. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it will. And, and it is yeah. right now. It's because yeah. it's just, everything is completely automated, just like stock trading was 20 years ago. So we're now all getting scored. And pr- the problem is a lot of that data is bad. It's based on false assumptions, et cetera. So sometimes like your whole time, will actually be based on how they scored you as a customer. 
Um, and so you can actually, you know, in effect, be discriminated if they perceive you to be a bad customer. They'll just put you on long hold times versus other people. I mean, that's just the the level of kind of how the AI systems are evolving. Um, and then we haven't even talked about generative AI, which is opens up a whole new can of worms. Yeah, I think that's the, that's the key because that's that's something I took away from your book is that there's different kinds of AI. So, what what does that mean? Just generative AI. Generative AI. AI yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's basically the ability to take text and create images, text to create videos, text to create music, text to create longer text as well. But the issue is, is that for that to be facilitated, you need a lot of computing power, and you need a lot of data, right? And so the issues that we're facing right now is that the, who owns the data? What are they using for the data models? Um, mm -hmm. And then, and does that include copyright material? Does that include personal identifiable information like my voice or my biometrics? And this is gonna be a huge problem. I, I have a story right here. So we have family friends, they have a daughter in high school and she was told to write an essay about what's the best way to get into college. And so she actually wrote a humorous story about, I'm gonna to move to Montana, I'm gonna take up the bassoon, you know, just try to like work the, the demographics uh, to, to get into a good college. And she handed in the paper and her teacher said, you use chat GPT for that because it's too good. And so we, we now have a problem in which we don't know what's human generated and what's machine generated. And that's that's the big issue of the, the lack of transparency um, that we have and no food labels associated with content. And we're starting to see that big time with deep fakes and, uh, and especially on the pornography side as well. It's, it's, it's becoming a huge issue. Well, okay, so here's where I'll jump in with my thing that we were talking about before. So as a professional creative where it's art, right? She's writing, she's expressing herself. So that's a, a human expression, a self, a, a mode of self-expression for a young girl. And that it, to me, it's exactly what we're up against as artists in our unions that we're striking it. Have my shirt on again, guys, you can recognize by the color. I'm sorry. It's just like the frame won't get the guild in there, but you know, we had something happen uh, this week with the folks that were fighting you know, to get a fair deal from, which is called the AMPTP for people who don't know, which is basically the studios. Well, the studios have become streamers and the streamers are now and have always been data companies. They just are, they're tech companies. Um, I saw, I'm old enough and I've been doing this long enough that I saw the, I was writing and, you know, through the transition from old brick and mortar studios, the traditional studios we all think of, um, to all of a sudden the Silicon Valley folks coming down <laughs> into uh, my town you know, that I left um, and starting there, like the, we're gonna do the content now because we've got the audience and everything was very opaque. You would go and you would pitch to, and it's still this way, you'd pitch and you'd be pitching instead of to like a single executive that maybe I knew like from Warner Brothers or Paramount or something. and you know, oh, they love you, or I worked on this project, like blah, blah, blah. I'm now pitching to a panel of people that are there to represent a data bucket that they manage. So um, I, it, that's, it, was very, it was very disorienting when it first began. And it wasn't the early, early days of the Netflix. It, it was a little different. They were early days, they were like, it has to all be written and all be ready, and then we'll think about buying it because we don't know how to do this. And then they started bringing more executives in and creating these teams that you would pitch to and work with. So if they thought that the show was going to hit young adults, but also maybe new moms, right? With the babies and you got all those people that were responsible for those data buckets. That was the beginning of the end. I think that was like content now is about, um, what, how much we know we can sell it to and how much assurance we have that it's an already sold thing. Well, they're now relying on this technology, AI, to be the, the be all end all for that sure profit margin, right? There's something that they can already go to the accounting team and say, you know, we know from this one thing that we've got, 
it's going to deliver X, Y, and Z profits in this amount of time. This is very hard to do with human beings that are creators. You've got to have, if you can have a scripts that AI is just generating for you, then it's like a, it's a no brainer for them. Well, what they came out with today at the bargaining table is saying, okay, we're going to come to the table, back to the table with you guys. And this is what we're going to do about AI. We're not going to give up our AI generated scripts. We're going to keep, we want AI. We want to have scripts be created by AI. We want to have a voice. We want to say, hey, write us a story about X, Y, and Z, because we've got our data people telling us this is what people want to hear about. They want a show about a mom with a new baby and can't pay for diet, whatever the fuck, right? So we're going to do it. And we just want you guys to come in. And what we'll guarantee you is that as writers, you get the final touch on it. So you can, we're going to, we still want our AI scripts, but we'll let you touch it and then it can be your thing. But what they're really asking for is for us to work on the program, to teach it, to give it our voice because these scripts are shit. I know this for, I've talked to some people that like, they've got a lot of scripts written by AI and whoever's helping them out with that. It's not guild writers and they're all crap. They, they don't, they know they can't, it's, it's not working. It's not, there's no, there's no there there yet. Um, and so they're trying to use our strike to get us to come in and give them the human element that they're missing in their machine generated crap. And once they've got it from us, they always have it. Yeah. They're just trying to use you as a, a data model. And once they suck that up, then it becomes very difficult to actually identify what part of the script came from you or, or someone else, right? And so the funny thing is, is that they don't want that to happen with their copyrighted material, right? So they're gonna like go crazy if someone takes a, you know, a copyrighted, the Wizard of Oz and then generates something and 25% of this, you know, has, has Dorothy, et cetera. But they have no problem doing that with the actual, human beings in terms of their voice, the written language, et cetera. So their yeah, I, I, too. yeah, yeah. Their Im and their image as well. And then the thing is, yeah. is they can take it and then they can kind of blend it together. And then they're trying to copyright that, even though it's been based based on this. So it, it really goes down to that there, there needs to be, I mean, first of all, you should be, you should just be like their copyrighted material, right? That, that, and so I would hold firm on that personally. But then also from an AI perspective, there needs to be transparency. We should be able to take a video, an image, and ask the large providers of AI, did you create this or not? Right? That should actually be a regulation that if you're a large provider of AI with more than 10 million monthly average users, you should have a slash verify website where people can upload content. So like that teacher could take the girl's homework and say, chat GPT, did you generate it? And they and spit out yes or no, right? Because otherwise, yeah. we're just guessing whether or not this, it's like a, you know, it's like, uh, you know, is it an android or is it a human, right? We just don't know, right? I'm and, so concerned with what we're doing to our humanity with this. Why are we handing our humanity over to, it's, it's an appropriation. Because it's, our... it's, 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 they're trying to take away our labor. Right. We're, right. They're trying to right. they're trying to they're trying to take away the, the labor right. associated with it. So, yeah, I mean, I wrote a book. Right. And so probably someone's going to suck it up and merge it with three or four other things. And boom. Right. You know, so I've it, it'll be something that kind of sort of looks like me, but it, it, it fully isn't as well. So, yeah, I mean, look, we, we do need to um, be very careful that our data that uniquely identifies us should we should have rights over that um just like our content we have copyrights over it we have trade secrets over it. they have trade secrets the large things and so it's basically we need to have similar protections that the corporate uh corporations have as it relates to the content that they create and the ip that they have as well we have our own ip we should have rights over our ip which is stuff that uniquely identifies us i just had an idea for a movie guys Let's hear okay. it. Okay, so pitch it. The, we, the, this all happens, okay, and and AI, the chatbots win. You know, all all, all the LBs <laughs> push to the side. 
But then the Capites form a union and destroy all the executives, right? And then return all the human writers and it, everything just shifts around, right? Or we just unplug them. And we just create a virus and send it through them. Right, well, let me, hold on, hold on. How do they get rid of all the executives? All right, I'm putting that in <laughs> the right now to write the script. <laughs> <laughs> it's is it or I maybe your friend's daughter should write the script. I think what, yeah, one exactly. of the other. I, how could who, who can tell? When no I was one in, know I, it was yours, Greg. Well, at least we have this. We have this moment. This magical this moment. moment. It's it's they're gonna they're gonna on the internet yeah. forever. It forever, or it's just going to be like you know, body doubled, whatever the hell it is. Um, no, when I was in high school, my, my one of my best friends uh wrote an essay, and the teacher accused him of plagiarizing it from something called Simpsons Notes. So, this this shit has been going on for a long time. Smart, creative kids get 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 tagged by dumb teachers, it's just something, that yeah. Happens. And hacks become executives, and and <laughs> yes, it's like it's like that's what it sounds like, Tom, is that you're just describing hackery right as a as a as a a machine learning program as a software hack program. not hacker big difference yeah, yeah not hacker but hack yeah. as a as in a writing hack yeah artistic yeah. hack uh, yeah we haven't seen i mean it's going to be some crazy stuff happening with ai it's uh, it's the the ai to music and ai to video is just yeah. going to be i mean if we're blown away with uh, the image the, the pictures and the text wait till you see a lot of these movies being able to be generated by AI. Well, and the music. Are we sure that Post Malone isn't just AI? Because it seems <laughs> AI to me. He seems like just he does not real. I don't know. Are we sure Drake is? Yeah, he's he's real. We saw him on the sideline at the Raptors game. So, um, so one thing that you've been uh, that you've been involved with is this Delete Act, which I think is really cool. So, um, tell everybody what that is and uh, what's the update since last we spoke. What's happening with it? Yeah, it's uh, my contributed to a bill that's currently active in California. It's Senate Bill 362. It's called the California Delete Act that basically allows you to go to a website and say, please delete my data from all these data brokers who are these entities that we don't have a relationship that collect all this information and sell it to anyone with credit cards. And so a lot of the crappy things that have happened uh, that we've heard about, like, you know, visitors to abortion clinics that people are serving ads to them while they're in the abortion clinics. It's, it's all because of the data broker. And so we, we passed the Senate. We're now in the assembly and oh my gosh, it's the, 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 the industry is really trying hard to, to fight against it. So it's going to be a big, it's a big battle right now. Uh, and so uh, if you're in California, tell your local assembly person or state Senator that you support Senate Bill 362, because it gives you rights to actually say, I want my data deleted, kind of like the FDC's do not call registry. Uh, but there are some people whose business is to suck up your data and sell the data th that don't like it. And so uh, there's uh, interesting opposition going on, a lot of back and forth. So we'll, we'll see if we can get this through. It's, it's not going to be easy. It's a, it's a great idea. And I have to say, um, you know, data brokers, which again, are these third party sort of shadowy entities, you know, uh, true story. They, uh, they went to Prigozhin and they were like, would you like to join us and be a data broker? And he was like, yeah. dude, no fucking way. I have, I have ethics, man. You know? Like, well, so, well, I mean, but a lot of that data actually is, they don't restrict in a lot of cases who can buy the data. And so if you, I mean, you literally yeah. could have a, like a shell company that says, buy me all the data about active military people and their location. And so yeah. someone actually, someone yeah. actually demonstrated like, oh, here's a service person. And now he's at an air base in Jordan. And now he's coming back to this location and he goes to that location every night, which is his home, his bed down, et cetera. So that's the level of granularity. It's the precise tracking of our geolocation. And what we're trying to do with this California Delete Act is say, no, you, you know, we won't, we don't want you to track every move that we make. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do with this delete act. Okay. It's give a, us the number again, the name of it's the Senate bill 362, California Senate bill 362. It's the California delete act. And it is coming up to a vote in the assembly Appro appropriations committee. And there's a bunch of, there's an army of uh, lobbyists and uh, okay. have Form Sacramento to try to kill this from the data broker industry, and uh, on the 
the side of supporters is Planned Parenthood, a lot of the privacy groups, LGBTQ groups, et cetera, because this is the type of information that will be used against, to, to be weaponized against you know, people that have transitioned. Or, I mean, think about like if you're a domestic violence survivor, right? You don't want someone to be able to like buy your current address, right? And track you down. You should have the right to be able to say, no, I want all my data, my personal data that's associated with me deleted. What happened to right to privacy? It, it, have we just decided that doesn't matter anymore from Roe getting overturned to all, like what the fuck guys? I'm sorry to swear. Yeah. Well, privacy is Why? not in the constitution. There's no such thing. There's it does the not exist. The word privacy is not in the constitution. There's the fourth amendment, but that, that stops the government from, uh, you know, they, in theory, they need a, a search warrant, right. To okay. come into our house and look through our personal papers and effects. Now in Cal, luckily, I think it was like in Montana, they actually had privacy in the constitution. So that stopped like the abortion ban there. I think it was Montana, but in California, in 1972, we added the, the right to privacy as an alienable right to our constitution via ballot proposition. And so we actually constitutionally have a right to, to privacy, but most of the United States actually technically doesn't have that. And we do not have mm. a federal privacy law. There's 12 states. And then what happened is California came out with this privacy law. And then Amazon and some of the other tech companies said, oh, well, and so they've actually written them like the Virginia privacy law, if you're in Virginia, that was written by Amazon, right? And so you oh, actually yeah. have yeah. privacy rights on paper, but it's very difficult to actually take advantage of them as well. So the majority of the 12 states that now have some form of a privacy law, it was written by lobbyists for tech. The only one that is kind of pure is the California uh, Consumer Privacy Act, which was amended uh, in 2020 with the California Privacy Rights Act that hasn't and wasn't written actually by the tech industry. This is all documented with Reuters and everyone else. They, yeah. they, they're going in and they're writing the laws right now through ALEC. You probably have talked about you know, yeah. the, that, and they're doing that on the tech side as well. And so uh, I'm trying to battle for consumers to give the deletion capability from these data brokers uh, with the Senate bill, and we'll see if that can get through. I hope, I really hope it does. But it's a, it's a, we have a fundamental battle going on because it, it's no longer about using your data for advertising. It's increasingly being weaponized against us, and it's going to get worse with LGBTQ, tran, abortion rights, with states banning it, and then wanting to get the data from Google to in Idaho to, to, to track, prove that track the, these, Exactly, the exactly, yeah. yes. Okay, so, so here, here, I have this question. Yes. How important is it, since most of these tech companies are California companies still, yeah? Or are they have they all dispersed now? Well, um, I mean, I mean, the money obviously, certainly Google, still is in California. Meta, Google, Apple are California companies, and right. you've got Amazon and uh, Microsoft are uh, up in uh, Seattle, and then you've got right. obviously TikTok is basically China. So. China, yeah, and then and I guess Shitter, Jeter, X I T T E R, Jeter is in um, Texas, Texas. Now, right? He's Texas. Twitter, Who, oh, X? Twitter, X, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, he, uh, technically they're in, in Texas as well. Okay. So, yeah. But I just feel like it's really important that we have, and you, correct me if I'm wrong, but a state a senator from our state in the U S Senate Senate that understands all of this. No, well, we, we, people are getting better. I mean, there's some really super smart people like, uh, Senator Wyden, um, and, uh, okay. you know, some others as well, but, but you still, it's, it's really funny when you see these hearings, you, you see people complaining, uh, about like, well, my mom, my mom wasn't getting my email spams from my campaign. And then like, well, it turned out it was in that junk folder. Right. You know, so we, or there was another person that was, you know, saying to the CEO of Google is like, you know, so when I use my iPhone and the CEO of Google said, well, uh, sir, uh, we don't I'm make Google. iPhones. I know. Yeah, I, we I do the Android. All. I'm like, oh my god, they're they're so they're so out of it, right? So, I would hope that uh, we need. I, I'm just going to push for this. We need uh, to elect people now in all of our election cycles. So those of us informed that actually understand this and aren't still mystified by a fax. 
Well, I, it's it's only going to get uh, the problem is is that we don't have rights over our data, which we've talked about, right? right? And you are experiencing firsthand not having rights over your data meeting AI. Right. And it's going to get worse. My and so, work, my work, my, no, no, you, I'm losing my job. We're all going to lose our jobs. It's because of this. Horrible. Yeah. So, so we need, I mean, first and foremost, we need uh, laws as it relates to the data. Then we need some guardrails with AI, but then we also need antitrust because these companies are so big and they are anti-competitive that they've created basically no fly zones. Yep. for large elements oh, of the the American economy. Like who's going to come out with a competitive search engine? Uh no one because it's like it's, it, they dom Google dominates it or a mobile operating system right. etc. So we do have a big issue that direct all these things lead into some of the issues that we have with our democracy as well. I mean that's you know the whole issue of like you know Trump the fundamental issue is is that with Everything that happens with Trump, I think in the back of mind, we say, oh, this will finally, people will finally flip. No, they won't flip because <laughs> the people will finally change their mind because he's a mugshot. No, they're in this bubble that gets served more and more by the algorithms to amplify the same stuff. And everyone's in yeah. their rabbit holes right here. And so, yeah, we do have a big issue with the tech companies uh, with algorithmic amplification that that ties into some of these issues with AI to f continuously create use the data to create personalization to keep us in the bubble to keep us online etc. So, but on that well, note, on that <laughs> note <laughs> I think you're transitioning us really well into into our next topic. Do you feel um, Tom? We'd love for you to stick around. Can sure. you stick around for? Oh, yeah, that'd be okay, good. Amazing. Okay, good. And before we before we move on, just yes, I want to say I said this before, but I'm going to say it again. Thank you for doing this because you don't have to. I, I feel like when you're out there in Silicon Valley and you've been successful, what you're supposed to be doing is just hoarding money and building rockets to fly to a different planet. So thank you for taking care of us earthlings. You know, we appreciate it and we appreciate the work you're doing. And thank you. I'm being jokey about it, but I mean it. I yeah, I, I think it's it's great that you're doing this because not enough people are doing it you know, that are in the know. And I think it's, it's really vital. So thank you. Thank you for your service. Tom. Yeah. Yay, Tom. <laughs> and for coming and being part of our little hangout. We love hanging out with you. We like seeing the sunshine too, coming through your door. All right. He's the five of the five, eight tonight. Right? He's the five of the five, mm. eight. All right. I put the clock on guys. Right. So Tom, we're going to have eight minutes to discuss trader tracker. Greg, what are we talking about? Okay. This, this comes from uh, Nia Molinari. Um, who people familiar with Vail know her. Uh, she's the former stripper who wrote about Giuliani, and and she she has a way of looking at things, which is which is interesting, right? So uh, she figured this out. So this is not this is really her work that I'm just reporting here. I'm going to give credit here. Okay, so um, yeah, there was a debate this week, right? A GOP debate. I'm sure everyone watching the show watched it with bated breath to see. Which fascist is going to be the loser? To right, whatever. I, I, spoiler alert. I watched not a, not five seconds of this bullshit. Um, and no way. Okay, now Trump famously didn't go to the debate. What was he doing instead? Do you remember? He was he with Tucker. Tucker. Right, but when you watch the interview with Tucker. And especially the beginning where they're just out front of the, I don't know where the fuck they are, but they're out front and they're like, Hey guys, aren't you supposed to be at the debate? And they both look in the camera, like, like they're like they're Laverne and Shirley opening the door or whatever. Oh, it's for me. Okay. Yes. They you know that, Tomasso you know what I'm talking about in the opening credits of Laverne yes. and, and they look at the camera. It's worth going to Tucker's just to look at the beginning of this. Okay. Okay. So the impression created and they talk during the interview, like, Hey, aren't you supposed to be at the debate tonight? And Trump's like, duh, 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 duh. okay. Well, that was not live. That interview was recorded, and it was not recorded on Wednesday of this week. It was recorded well before, okay? Because Tucker Carlson left on Saturday night, August eight nineteenth, excuse me, to go to Hungary, which is a place he loves to go. He loves him some Victor Orban. Um, 
LB, very quickly, tell everybody who Viktor Orban is and his relationship to the Russian mafia. Oh, he's a bag man for Semyon Mogilevich. And who's yeah. Semyon Mogilevich? Semyon Mogilevich is still on the, is back on the most wanted, right? For mm -hmm. being this, uh, the head of all global fucketeers. Um, yeah. But he was at one point, and at this at the point, this point, the head of the Russian mafia, the Sultan Sky Bratva, who we were talking about earlier with Prigozhin. Ah, okay. Interesting. interesting. So Viktor Orban, president slash dictator. Oh, and he of... installed Putin. Just so everybody's clear. Oh, He's... right. That too. Okay. Yeah, so, okay. So um, that's who Viktor Orban is. Okay. So again, on the 19th on Saturday, when you go to Central Europe, you, you leave usually the night before and you arrive at dawn. That's usually how it works. Okay. Um, so the, the interview is recorded before Tucker leaves. It's on the 18th, 19th, maybe even the 17th of August, like yeah, not too far before, but you know, a good four or five days before. Okay. On Sunday, August 20th, uh, Tucker Carlson meets with the president of Serbia, Vucic, uh, wow. Serbia, as my friend Moscow ever sleeps describes like the little, you know, the little dog that will just follow Russia around and do whatever it says. <laughs> so, um, and that guy, there's a lot of stuff. Again, uh, Nia Molinar wrote about this guy named Michael Michael, who's a big Serbian mobster and that, that whole thing. So, um, this is another like kind of dictatorial dude that's in Europe. So Tucker's meeting with him on Sunday, uh, at, um, on August 20th, on August 21st, uh, Vucic goes and meets with, uh, Victor Orban and, uh, Erdogan of Turkey. Yeah. They sit and they, they figure out what they're going to do about gas prices because that's something that they these three dictators desperately want to talk about is gas prices, you know, uh, hot air. Um, on Tuesday, the 22nd of August, uh, Orban is with our buddy Tucker Carlson. Oh. Not the first time these motherfuckers have talked together. So uh, there's a you could you can go to Tucker's Web page if he hasn't blocked you. And uh, I don't know if you can block people anymore. You can go there and take a look at this. Uh, it's all here. It's all time stamped. Okay, Tuesday, okay. Tucker's meeting there. Um, and then on Wednesday uh, is the debate. And Trump is at Bedminster, apparently. Um, I cannot figure out where they are when they recorded it. I, I, there's lots of things that said it was recorded early. No one reported on where they at Mar -a -Lago, were. Probably Mar-a-Lago, but... It's not Mar-a-Lago. Maybe it's Bedminster. Bedminster. It looked like a... I have no... It might have been and in Maine. I don't know. And a private flight to Victor Orban to... It's a weird-looking house. Okay, and then, um, <laughs> then Thursday, Trump surrenders. So, again, look, I'm not saying there's anything untoward here at all. I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying, if I'm Trump and I want to flee, and I want to put the little feelers out to various leaders that might be sympathetic to my plight. Uh, I'm not going to send it in a Twitter DM. I'm not going to send it in, you know, some other thing because he doesn't send emails. But I don't know. You meet with Tucker. Tucker immediately flies to meet with these dictators. And then they kind of make it seem like they're there together on Wednesday when they're not fucking there together on Wednesday. It's just a little bit fishy to me. So again, might be nothing, probably nothing, probably just a coincidence that the day after recording the interview with Trump, Tucker just is like, I'm going to go meet these dictators in, in Central Europe. Uh, probably nothing, but you know, bears, uh, bears looking at, I think bears looking at. All right. I want to uh, know what Tom thinks. Tom, what do you think, first of all, about everything that Greg just said, but also most importantly, is he fleeing or is he <laughs> staying? Should he stay? Or should he go? The clash. Oh, yeah. Should he stay or should he go? That's so, easy I, you know, I don't know if he's going to flee. Um, you know, he's the kind of guy that would try to do the same cooing that he did for the election that'll do for him being jailed, right? You know, send the mob, uh, distract, disrupt, uh, et cetera. So, uh, and, you know, he, I think he's waiting to see if he can be elected before these things come to trial as well. So I think that's a little bit too early for him to thinking about seriously fleeing. I think the key thing is what he's focusing on is trying to delay all these trials as long as possible. He becomes president, kills them all, and then he gets the Georgia legislature to change the uh, pardoning rules down there to make it about the governor. I think that's, I think that's his strategy right now. Now, just so you know, Tom, LB and mm -hmm. I do have a bet about oh. will he flee, will he not flee? I think he will not flee. 
not because of any smart thing like you just outlined, just because he doesn't want to leave his fucking omelet bar. I don't think he wants to eat the food in UAE. I think he's just like, Ugh. also, he's 80 almost. And like, he's gotten away with it up to this point. So what, what is, he's not going to get away with it this time. But, I, I think he, he probably just loves being like a political prisoner or something like that. I think he would, you know, he'd love to be a martyr and then eventually, yeah. you know, have a mob try to spring him out of jail or something like that. I think that would be the, the best thing. He's for not going to. Look, if he, okay, well, all right, <laughs> we're going to see, we're going to see. I, I just, I, I, that guy's not sticking around to have some, in his mind, lowly AG or district attorney, um, actually put him behind bars. No way. Yeah, but, but even no if way. he, I mean, you have to have the case and then he goes on appeal and then, yeah, maybe like a half hour before he finally gets arrested after kind of pushing things as back as possible, then he may get on that flight. Uh, but uh, I think he's just all focused on getting the delays. Or before things can come out at trial. I don't know. Well, I don't think he's going anywhere. I think he's sticking around. I think he's... I... He's fleeing. Have you seen? He can't even walk down a ramp for God's sake. He doesn't sake. need to. Where are they going to shoot his plane out of the sky? The only people who would shoot his plane out of the sky is, is the Kremlin, and they're the ones that are going to be come to Papa, right? Oh, maybe they'll be like come to Papa and then shoot his plane out. Of the no, sky. he's going to be in the middle. He, if he goes, if 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 he goes, he'll go to the Middle East and be on some really nice golf courses, and there'll be like a Trump yeah. Trump hotel, etc. So it's Absolutely. going to be. That, that's where he's going to be. Or Beijing. Yeah. I'll, I'll stick to the China thing as well. I think that's always on the table. Um, it's pronounced Gina. Come on. Okay. <laughs> All right. Ah! Okay. Thank you. Well, we have one more. Wait, wait, wait. Quick. Yeah. Real, real you quick. You want to do the announcements? I, what do we no, have? No, no, no. I do have announcements, but real quick before more, we no. move to the next trading yeah. tracker. Okay. I feel like cheese bro. I feel like, okay, there's 19 of these guys. Some of them are going to plea. Some of them are going to go to jail. Some of them aren't. I feel like cheese bro is, is the most likely to, I'm just, this is just pure literary, whatever. Cause he's like, he kept a low profile. He moved to Puerto Rico. Like, I don't know. I think this guy's going to go back to Puerto Rico. We're never going to see him again. A uh, part of me is rooting for that. I think it'd be oh, cool. You mean other vanished. people who will flee? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Go to Ecuador, cool. use cash, give false information. Tell everyone you're going somewhere. You're not going. Keep Maybe. moving. Keep moving. That's good. Look at him. Look at his picture. Does he look like a guy that would flee? It looked look like, like a guy saying, I am an attorney who is very staid and calm. I'll be fine. And then goodbye. Oof, he's like, you know, Kaiser so say that shit. He's out of there. <laughs> Never see him again. I'm just going to say. Right. I'm just going to say. I'm not say. taking that bet. I, Happy I, to be wrong. Happy to be wrong. <laughs> all right. Now, this is Tom. This is our, our point where we normally have, we if we have any announcements. So let's start with you. Do you have anything? Your book came out. Everyone can find your book. Thank you. Yeah. There it there is. Go, Kenny it's a good one. So is there an audio? Did you do an audio? Uh, I didn't do it, but in terms of recording it, but yes, there's an audio book and there's an okay. ebook. So yeah, book came out on Tuesday and uh, it's uh, been going really well. So that's been the focus of this week uh, right now. So I'm still in the, uh, the sunlight basking in the glow of uh, <laughs> having my uh, book released. Uh, it's great. I wanted to tell you, by the way, because it's, you know, you were like, well, it's a bestseller on Amazon. Uh, and you said, well, maybe if it's the New York Times, the thing about these bestseller lists is once you're on the bestseller list, you are a best-selling author for all time. Because mm. I snuck on to the LA Times bestseller list mm. for one glorious week. And I am forever an LA Times bestselling author. Forever. It's like wow. Kevin Garnett said when he won the NBA championship, it's like knowledge. Once it is obtained, it is obtained. So, you know, you have that forever, Tom. It's always okay. yours. No yeah. one can ever take it away from you. Yeah, it's too early to see what the results are, but it's it, the nice thing. I can at least say it's an Amazon bestseller. That's fine. Uh, Amazon. That's it's, fine. It's, it's at least the Amazon bestseller means people are actually fucking buying it. So yeah. that's great. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm all for that. I'd rather have that than the, than the other places, quite frankly. Enjoy all right. it. Enjoy Greg, it. do you Thank have you. any announcements? I have two announcements. All right, um, let's hear it. Okay, we're gonna we do have a five eight podcast. That's a podcast of this. Yeah. Um, the engineer that we have, who was who does these things and prepares them, did not do last week's episode. 
yet because he's an asshole and he was busy and sorry it's me so i'm gonna i'm gonna get this up uh i'll get them both up over the weekend so please subscribe to our podcast if you prefer to uh you know listen to this in audio form while you're like i don't know doing the dishes or whatever walking around um my podcast prevail is back today i had the this is the the season six premiere tom was on last season uh that this season, season premiere, I got Denver Riggleman on. Um, he's oh, been on this so show. Good. Yeah. He's so fun. At one point, he he said something that made me laugh for like forty seconds without stop. Like I was crying. I was like, and I don't laugh like that all the time. It was great. And he said a lot of like I I, I wrote a quick thing today, but I could have written twenty things based on little things that he said. So please go listen to that. I encourage everyone. It's really a good one, and not just because me. Because go listen to what Denver says. It's it's good stuff. So. That's it. Okay. Those are my. Uh... Those are those are your announcements. I have one announcement. I want everyone to go to the strike fund, if you can. I don't care if it's one dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, and donate to the strike fund for writers. Okay? okay. We've been on strike over a hundred days now. It's been, uh, I don't even know. I'm losing count. And folks are losing. They're losing everything. They're starting to lose everything, which was the whole point of the villains that we're up against here, um, as they've stated in the press, then <laughs> had no shame about us stating it, but just go to the strike fund. You can go to go to WGA West. You can go to WGA West website and you'll find a place for the strike fund. And I will also, as soon as this, uh, uh, our show's over tonight, I will post it on Twitter. Um, so everyone can go in, just donate, know that folks are really, really struggling. And I don't know that people are going to come back from this. So they need some resources. Um, and our union is really, really wonderful about getting folks the assistance they need in a, in a super fast and timely manner. And none of it goes somewhere weird. It all goes to writers in need. And there's a whole checklist of assessments of whether you're actually someone in need or not. It's not, there's no way to scam this. Okay. These are people who have given you some of the stuff that you love, that, you know, lines that you love, things that move you, content that um, has made a difference in your life. I know because it's made a difference in mine and all of ours. And they are hurting. We are hurting now. So please, 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 because we're strong and we're going to stay on that line and we're going to keep striking because this is it. If we give in, Everything that we just talked about as sort of worst case scenario in terms of taking human beings, our own humanity out of the, of art itself is going to come to pass. And so uh, we'll hold that line because now it's almost like, what have we got to lose at this point? You've taken everything from us. So um, I'll post that. I just know some, I have some folks in my, I know some people that are really hurting and they're we need resources into that strike fund and it's not a broke strike fund. There's a lot of money in it, but just understand, you know, every month people are flooding in trying to save their homes, make sure their kids go back to school and can afford, you know, to get books. This is where we're at. This is where we're at. Okay. Okay. That's my Good. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Last topic. Meadows Soprano, because we couldn't think of a better title. Okay. <laughs> well, we wanted to talk about Mark Meadows, Tom, um, because he's just so odd. He's such an odd dude. Uh, I, I do have a timeline. I'm going to pull up my timeline. There was an article written about him um, in by Just Security, and a lot of folks uh, follow oh, that and know one. that, on August yeah. 8th. I'm not going to go through the timeline of all this stuff, but I'm going to give you the big takeaways um, so that we can remember who this guy is, right? Remember it was, it, the, he wasn't the chief of staff the whole time. I thought he came after John Kelly because I completely forgot about Mick Mulvaney. <laughs> How could you forget about someone as dynamic as Mick Mulvaney? No, no. But if everyone remembers Mick Mulvaney, it was the COVID ha had come and Mul uh, Mulvaney criticized Trump publicly. He went in front of the podium because he was getting frustrated 
Um, it looked like there was maybe personal frustrations with his daughter and vaccines or whatever, but he criticized the president said, maybe he stop watching TV and get on this. Right. Cause it was all so ridiculous. It was so crazy what Trump was doing. And then boy, was he ejected. Kapoo. He got jettisoned to Ireland or whatever. And Mark Meadows ended up chief of staff. And that was because he was trying to get jobs on K street. Right. Um, and so bragging about Trump wants me chief of staff. And then lo and behold, Trump was like, okay, let's get that guy. He wants to, he says he's right. And kind of, he kind of fucked himself into this job. Um, and then proceeded to just be horrendous. So here's one takeaway. Meadows and Giuliani created a parallel track to raise election fraud claims. So mm. there was, election fraud claims that were going on and then Giuliani and Meadows were like, okay, let's, we need more than one. We need more than one route of claiming um, of doing all this election fraud claims. Um, uh, second takeaway, Trump campaign staff followed up on Meadows theory. That's a thing. They named something Meadows theory that tens of thousands of illegal aliens voted in Arizona. I can't believe we actually haven't seen anything in Arizona come. Has he been indicted in Arizona yet? Uh, we, the week's not over yet. <laughs> okay. Third takeaway. Meadows helped introduce President Trump to GO, DOJ official Jeffrey Clark. The underwear, oh, man, underwear boy. Man, the pantless man. Um, Captain Underpants. Body to Alcy, acting attorney general, and used the Justice Department to overturn election results in Georgia. So just a reminder... Clark is Jeffrey Clark is because of Mark Meadows. Mm. So we're going to learn more about that. Meadows expressed upset. This is fourth along with Trump in response to uh, Bill Barr's having told the AP there was no election fraud. So he's just, he's in this so deep on every level. Five Meadows made a surprise visit to Georgia where he met with the secretary of state's lead elections investigator. Trump called her the next day on Meadows suggestion and in the call urged her to find fraud in Fulton County. So the whole Ruby thing and all of that, that Giuliani was cooking up, right? That was Mark Meadows making sure that Trump was connected. I also kind of think that on that call with Raffensperger, which we played in our media tonight, I feel like Trump didn't remember the number 11,800. Like somebody mm. wrote that on a piece of paper and slid it in front of him, and he read it off the paper while he was on the call, on the call. Guaranteed, that happened, and it was either Cleta Mitchell doing that or Mark Meadows because they were the other two people with Trump at the time of that call. So here we go. Um, six Meadows arranged and participated in the call. What I just said, mm. which Trump asked Georgia Secretary of State Raffensperger to find eleven thousand seven hundred eighty votes. And during the call, Meadows asked the Georgia officials to share voting data, even after they told him they could not because it was protected by law. So break the law for us. Just give it to us. Um, seventh, in several communications with the Justice Department in violation of White House and DOJ contract contacts policy, Meadows pressured the department, this is the Justice Department, the DOJ, to investigate baseless allegations of election fraud. Eight, then acting Secretary of Defense's Chief of Staff, Cash Patel, says he spoke Ugh. to Meadows nonstop on January 6th. So everybody was talking to Meadows. That guy from Puck News was talking to Mark Meadows. Everyone was talking to Mark. Jenny Thomas was talking to Mark Meadows. Everybody. And then nine, in his final days in office, Trump hoped to issue a preemptive pardon for Meadows, Giuliani, and possibly himself. So I can't, the one thing about him is, is he Tom from Succession, where he's just, the pain sponge for Trump and he's just going to do anything that Trump wants and he'll be the avatar for him. And he's just going around, but it's causing him no matter how much pain it's causing him, he'll do it. Cause he's that big of a sycophant. Cause he's not, where's he going from here? He's not going. Tom at least could have succeeded. Jail. I'm going to go with jail. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, well, I definitely think, and I said this last week, I think he's Weisselberging this whole thing. I think yeah. he's, Greasing Jack Smith enough to keep that because that's a very scary prosecutor and a very scary thing and stonewalling in Georgia and freaking out in Georgia. And I think he's playing all this however he has to play it, but he's going to get to the finish line and pull a Mike Flynn or Alan Weisselberg and all of a sudden, you know what, just whatever, send me to jail, 
figuring he'll get, you know, probably communicating every part of his deal and what he's telling them, sharing that back with Trump. Well, I've just told him this. I've just told him that with his attorneys. This is just my speculation. Don't come sue me. I'm just saying I wouldn't put it past this guy that he's put himself in the position to be a mole, right? And then he'll just take the hit, figuring maybe he'll get six months in some kosher prison. Yeah, club fed. Yeah, Club fed. Mm-hmm. That's my take on it. But I just wanted to remind everybody who Mark Meadows, how, what were the points, the pain pressure points where he was actually right there and involved. I think that article remind yourself that article, just security It's in just security Meadows timeline. Yeah. That's a, that's a great article. Um, You know, Meadows is, is a, he's a curious guy. I mean, I had Denver on the podcast. I want to read a little bit. This is Denver's book, the breach. And he writes about Meadows because what happened was Denver Riggleman was trying to figure out all the text messages and who they came from and stuff like that. So he had the phone numbers, but didn't know who they were. Right. And then Meadows just gives them all the stuff that he has or some of the stuff or a percentage of the stuff. And from that, they're able to, you know, work backwards and figure it out. And he calls it sort of the Rosetta Stone. And he writes in his book, this is, again, this is Denver Riggleman's book. um, Some of the world's greatest mysteries are why people do stupid things. Months later, I still catch myself scratching my head, wondering what had possessed Meadows to deliver incriminating evidence right into the hands of congressional investigators. Did he simply have an awful legal team where the text provided by mistake? Could he have actually wanted to assist our work or was Meadows trying to play some kind of chess game with the select committee? Did he figure he could appear to be cooperating or maybe even make some sort of deal while not handing over anything useful? And I asked him on the, on the podcast, what do you think now? Cause this book is, you know, whatever. And he said, well, I think he agrees with you. LB. He says, yeah. Um, he's edging it. He's greasing both sides. He's trying to, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's very, very curious. Is why did he do these things? Like, I remember when that came out, when he gave over that stuff, um, everybody was mad at him. The Republicans were mad at him, and the Democrats were mad at him. Everyone hated. Was the guy from Puck News mad at him? I, 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 I don't know who this guy is. I don't know what this puck is. Um, it's just he's just that that doesn't matter you don't need to okay but it, it's i'm so glad i don't you don't need to yeah. um it's good yeah i i can't I, I think he's dumb but denver said he's not dumb and he's met him so he knows you know okay. like I, I think he's dumb too that was as you know that was my thing i'm like i think he's a moron and cassidy hutchinson ran the whole fucking country for four months yeah i do think she ran the whole country for four months i really do think that i really I think do think so too he's busy like texting people i think he's, he's got like really good text game. or something yeah, yeah I, something what do you think tom what do you think of mark meadows you know do you have do you think of mark meadows <laughs> no i don't but i, I think he kind of it's indicative of what he did with his voter registration that, you know, just kind of shows that he's kind of above this. He's talking about voter fraud, voter fraud. And then there's what, some rental of a shack or something like that in North Carolina that he says that he's associated with and he doesn't live there. So it's just, you can kind of judge people when they do things like that in terms of how they play fast and loose with the law. And, And to me, you know, just basic where you're registered to vote, um and, and trying to fool people it's kind of maybe indicative of uh how he how he deals with other things well we do have that personal data point on him so i don't think we can broker it anywhere but <laughs> I, 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 you know no one seems to be interested i think he got let off didn't he didn't he get that got passed over so. yeah which is disappointing like it it's disappointing. everyone's like voter fraud voter fraud okay here we got a guy that that's doing voter fraud and like, oh, that's no big deal or, or, or whatever. But yeah, and also I think someone else put together not only this timeline, but they they compared it to his book, right? His, and like things didn't match and he was like flat out lying in the book as well. So, so it's- His yeah. book, you brought up his book though, because the, it was the authors of the, or the ghost writers of the book that Trump that was tr- bragging to on those exactly. I forgot yeah. about that. That's another Meadows- just fucking dumb shit. He is dumb. I mean, he's dumb. I mean, he, he is, is he is not dumb. He's not It's almost like he's naive. Um like he can't conceive. I again, I think he's Tom in Sopranos, but without 
the fabulous talent. He's the chat GPT version <laughs> of um, <laughs> WOM scans. Did Christy call uh, Vivek that, you know, the chat GPT of like Mog Mog oh, or did he? like that? Oh, I don't know. We didn't, we really didn't oh. like it. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Is... Can Tom, somebody posted this earlier. Tell us about Vivek. He's a oh, tech yeah. guy. Yeah. What, what can you tell us about him? Because I, I, I call him Russia Swami because he's clearly a Putin asset. And I know that, you know, uh, Peter, what's his fuck is funding him. But what, what, did, What's his deal? Like, what's the deal with him in Silicon Valley? Do people know who he is? Is he no. an upstart? Okay. <laughs> no. Yeah. Florida, no. Right? He's just like a guy that got money. And... Yeah. 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 So yeah. no, he, no, no one knows him here. So. Oh, okay. Because it, it, I, I kind of thought that he was supposed to be this silic, this tech guy, but no, he's not. He's I think not. he's more of a biotech guy or something like that. And uh, so no, mm -hmm. no. But uh, bi bi biotech is a fancy word for full of shit, right? That's, that's... <laughs> look, look, I mean, he's just, I mean, he's just like mega on steroids. Mm -hmm. And uh, what he said about Ukraine was just completely yeah. insane. Um, disqualifying. And it was yeah, yeah. completely disqualifying, um, which is if someone like that were to win, then Ukraine's toast. Yeah. Yeah. I someone like that cannot win. Um, well, I don't someone like that did win with Trump in 2016. Pull, so I don't think he can pull vo votes. I don't think he's he's just a he's just a clown. We've got um, to deal with a clown. It's a and white it's, supremacist party, by the way. Yeah, um, I don't think he's going to do well ultimately with the white yeah, supremacy. Nobody party. wants. I'm just going to say he's got. Uh, yeah. He's yeah. got, he needs to go sit with the board of executives at Netflix to figure out who his constituency is. <laughs> they could, they could nail it. <laughs> I don't think he knows who it is. Yeah. Um, but uh, they could tell him they've got all the data. They know, they know exactly who smiled while watching uh, whatever that was that he was and anything he's yeah. been on and at what minute or down to the second in the broadcast, they actually smiled. Yeah. If problem. you translate his name, it actually means data bucket. That's actually his name. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it. Those are our those are our uh, five. Those topics. are our topics. Uh, they are for tonight. Those, those are our topics. Um, Tom Camp. All right. I'm going to show the. Where do we go? I, I have a time. music stand in front of me, which I don't usually have. The book is called "Containing Big Tech: How to Protect Our Civil Rights, Economy, and Democracy." Bestseller, man. Thank you. This was and, a, lot and of wor fun. a worthy bestseller. A worthy oh, well, bestseller. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Mazel well, Tov. I hope people read it. I hope they buy it. I hope they read it. I hope they learn from it. Uh, and, uh, you know, thanks for hanging out with us tonight. Yeah. It's been a great show. Yeah. Um, well, if, hey, call me if you need another guest. Okay. It's a lot of fun. So. <laughs> we will. It's, it's fun, right? Yeah. yeah it's, fun it's fun. Not bad. It, it, it's, uh, and now it's 6 30 there. So you can't have a cocktail. So it's, I good. can't yeah. have a cocktail now. I see. We got you yeah. there. We got yeah. you to the party. Yeah. This is fun. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, everybody, Thank for watching. You. We will see you next week. Who knows? Maybe Trump will be indicted again. <laughs> Who's to say? I don't know. Maybe chat GPT can write one of the indictments. We'll see. Oh, we'll see easy now. There's so much. Yeah. There's so much, so much there. I don't even know. It's the greatest indictment. It's so wonderful. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good Tom night. Kemp, thanks for joining us. Bye, everybody.